We're in the Bel Air right. home of, uh, believe it or not, Mr. Magoo, Jim Backus in uh, Southern California, and we're delighted to be well, here with you Well, thank you, you Chuck. I'm glad you found it. Of course, this is uh, Mr. Magoo's house. He paid for it, but I, I stay here as an, uh, an elder boarder. I've been, I've been with him for 30 three years now. You know, I'm surprised that you and your lovely wife got here. You came from the Beverly Hills Hotel out Sunset. You followed my instructions. Mm -hmm. We're kind of, this is a little hideaway, you know. It is, really. That gap in the bushes kind of jumps up. Uh, jumps up. That's right. But you know, it's a funny thing. In, in Hollywood, this is never my house until I no longer live here. This is the old Robert Montgomery house. Oh, it is. Uh, that's uh -huh. a, the, the thing they do in, in Hollywood. <laughs> you say, where do you live? Oh, we live in the old Robert Taylor Barber Stanwick house. <laughs> So I think this was the old Robert Montgomery. Before that was the Herbert Marshall. Oh, he, well, he built it. Magoo was in good company. Yeah, he was a lovely man. I, I did the oh, a couple pictures with Bart, as we call him. You know, he he was severely wounded in World War One and had a wooden leg, which he mm -hmm. was very brave. He was in pain most of the time. He was a lovely man. You are too. I must well, say. Well, thank you. Thank uh, you're you. You're very, very much. charming, and uh, it's so much of a pleasure to be here. And as long as we started off with Mr. Magoo, you said you've been doing Magoo, or you've known Magoo for thirty. Thirty-two years. We uh -huh. had the anniversary. I think in nineteen, we started in nineteen fifty-one or fifty-two. I'm not sure. And we've been on the air now, or on screen rather, or whatever. Uh, what, how many years is that? It's about oh, 35, 36 30, years. Yeah, a long time. And uh, Magoo started out, we made the first one, and uh, it wasn't Mr. Magoo, it was the nephew, Waldo. You know Waldo? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're looking, it was a story of a, of a boy on his vacation who was going to visit his uncle and kept falling off the, out of the car, and a bear would get in. And, of course, the uncle liked the bear better than the kid with the fur coat. It was a mistaken <laughs> identity. But it... Uh, they didn't know who to get the uncle. They had everything cast except that, and Jerry Hausner and John Hubley, may rest in peace, suddenly remembered I, I, I did a character uh, uh, on a lot of radio shows, a big, pompous, blowhard type of fella. And uh, they said, I wonder if that would fit in, and I, I went out and tried it. And we made the first one practically in a garage on very little money. Mm -hmm. And it took off just like overnight. It became a, a big, big, instantaneous hit. And in 1956 and 57, we won the Academy Awards back to back. We don't have the Oscars. They they, they went with another fella. Uh, when Edward R. Murrow came to visit on Person to Person, they were standing there. Oh. And oh. Uh, so Magoo has been a he's been a kind of a mixed blessing because a lot of times it's kept me out of good parts. In it pictures. has yeah, because people with, felt that, that you were too. That, that I was a blundering uh -huh. nearsighted old guy. And, of course, we also, when we start Magoo, we are making fun of someone's handicap mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. he cannot well, see very true. well. And we thought we might run into problems there, but I think in the 35 or 36 years we've been going, I don't think we've gotten more than one or two letters that ever commented that we were making fun. And I think the reason for that is Magoo sees better than you and I. Mm, he sees oh, yeah. exactly what he wants to see, <laughs> and he his his eye sharp is uh, eyesight is very very sharp. Now, have you made any Magoo cartoons recently? Uh, yeah, I've made Chuck. I made so many of them. Quite frankly, I, I they all kind of blend mm -hmm. into one. But mm -hmm. they have enough in the library to keep them going. Well, forever, well, because really as soon will. as they run out of playing the 10,000 we have, there's another generation mm -hmm. comes along. Mm -hmm. And so it's brand new to them. The same as Gilligan's Island. We only made about 100 Gilligan's Island. I think I, I don't know how many they've played in reruns. I, mm -hmm. I've lost count. I know I sit here and get furious because I don't get any money anymore. <laughs> the residuals have run out. Yeah, they've run yeah. out, and I sit, and people call me and say, hey, we saw you three times on Saturday. And I said, <laughs> yeah, it didn't make a quarter. <laughs> And, that, uh, that show was only on for about three, three seasons, years, wasn't three it? Years, yeah. yeah, and they took it off mm -hmm. when it was in the top ten. For why the did it? Mistake. I'm going to have a little iced tea, so sure. salute. Okay, I'm wondering why they finally, or why they took it off after such a short period of time. It was one of those things that, like you, network shenanigans. It was mm -hmm. uh, behind the scenes uh, finagling. What, the, what happened is they, they canceled Gunsmoke, mm -hmm. and. Uh, when Paley's wife, I think, heard that they'd canceled Gunsmoke, that was like spitting on the American flag. And he, Paley said, I want that show back. 
and want to put back on the schedule. Well, something had to give. Well, it was a case of Lucille Ball or us, and it was, it was in, inner politics of the real Madison Avenue mm -hmm. kind at its best. Because I, I, I had that dinner with Perry Lafferty, who was a, then vice president in charge of programming at CBS, and Mike Dan, Dan Mike Dan, mm -hmm. uh, and they assured me that the show was on the schedule for the next year. And I was having lunch the next day, and I got a long distance call. And they said, we've been canceled. And I said, you can't be canceled. I, ha I have a renewal right here with me. And so it was canceled. So it goes through City Hall. Oh, gee. So, but it still, has, it still is on. It's still playing. And uh, the public is still enjoying it. I know it. I, I, I go, go figure it out. It, it gets better with time. And the kids enjoy it more because they know. They, I, I've had a kid sit here and tell you what's coming next. I couldn't begin to tell. <laughs> so then Gilligan falls down, and mm -hmm. Mr. Howell picks him up, and they laugh more, it gets better, uh -huh. because certain things about comedy do bear repetition. Like in, in my generation, we used to fall down every time Fibber McGee went for the closet. Right. You knew what mm -hmm. was going to happen. Or Jack Benny got to start the automobile, and Mel Blanc went into his song and dance. <laughs> and uh, you knew it was coming, and you anticipated You relished it. And that's the way this works. Well, even though the, the, the checks have stopped coming in on Gilligan's Island for you, at least you can uh, enjoy the fact that you are reaching yet another generation with that It's a uh, very show. gratifying feeling yeah. to have to get received mail, well, particularly when I was sick. I, I got the most lovely letters from people. They didn't want anything. They just wanted to wish me well and, and a speedy recovery. Well, we wish you that, too, and you're looking very fit. Well, you thank you. I'm well. a little shaky from time to time, but I'm, I'm much better. I was pretty sick for a while. Mm -hmm. But you look fine. And uh, so I shouldn't... That was about five years ago, and I, I more or less was under house arrest. Mm -hmm. Though I did get out and made that picture uh, slapstick of, of the other kind, I think, as they call it now. It's the Kurt Vonnegut picture mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Jerry Lewis and Madeline Kahn and myself and the late Marty Feldman. It was a very, very good picture. A funny thing, I, I was sitting here in this room about two years ago, and Olga, the lady that showed you in, mm -hmm. she came to, to the door of the den and said, there's a young man who wants to talk to you. So I had no idea who it was, and I said, well, bring him in. We'll give him some hot tea, coffee, cocoa, whatever. And then came this kid. To me, he was a kid. And he introduced himself, and he said, uh, I'm Stephen Paul. I said, well, that's nice. I'm glad to see you. And uh, he said, I want you in my next picture. Well, I thought I had a mental case. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, your next picture? He says, yes, it's called Slapstick. I said, Slapstick? He says, yeah, Kurt Vonnegut wrote it. And I said, and you, that's your picture? He said, yes, I bought it from Kurt, and we're working on it together. I thought, oh, boy, better call the Bel Air Patrol and get the, <laughs> the rubber room ready. You know? <laughs> so he said, I got Jerry Lewis. And I said, Jerry Lewis is doing what? He, well, he plays the the kid, and Madeline Kahn plays the other kid. He says, that's right. And he said, I got Michelle Legrand to do the music. And, well, I thought by now he's crazy. So he said, and I want you to be the president. I said, well, you know, I thought I would you know, t play along with the kid. I said, all right, I'm the president. So uh, he said, uh, then I realized he wasn't kidding. Because he showed me some some, some of the, the rough rough. Uh, draft of the script and uh, so I had to cross the room for some reason and I said to him I said you know I don't walk so too well and he, he you know he said he said you you don't walk too well Mr. Backus I said no there was another president didn't walk too well either and he mm -hmm. said who Millard Fillmore I said <laughs> then I realized from where he stood 23 years Roosevelt was a long way off yeah. <laughs> So I'm, I'm kidding a little about that, but it, it, Steve loves to hear the story, anyhow. And he, he turned out to be a delightful. It was a delightful picture, and, and for 23 years old, he's now 25. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had hangovers longer. Than <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it's nice to see someone like that come along. It's refreshing. Cause I've, I've, I've made over, I think, close to 250 pictures. You really had quite a career on the screen, haven't you? Yeah, most people don't remember that. Well, you were always in a, in a supporting role. You never, the or seldom, friend. were in the... Uh, that's right, yeah. And 
and and you're there, you make an impact, but uh, they always remember Robert Taylor, you know. Yeah, that's right. I always used to wear the same suit, <laughs> so it wouldn't in a clash with the leading man. I used to know they would ch pick this suit because you, at the start of every picture, the producer would say to the wardrobe man, "Now I want to see all the wardrobe that these fellows are going to wear in this picture." So uh, Robert Taylor would come in with a pinstripe and produce like that. Now my pinstripe that cancels that. So he was wearing a light blue suit. I got that, that cancels that. So I had a, a mouse-colored gray suit. I think for 15 years straight, I wore it in every picture. That produces. That's it. That's it. Exact. That, that's marvelous. And uh, yeah, the hero's best friend. That was me. I was the guy that got splashed when Esther Williams jumped in the pool. <laughs> we used to have a, a good best friend club for a while. Let's see. Was it? Keenan Wynn was, uh, he, it was a, for a long time, either he had the part or I got the part. Mm -hmm. And uh, then a lot of our friends from radio used to work in pictures with me. Remember Frank Lovejoy? Sure, of he course. He was a big man in radio. And Everett Sloan mm -hmm. was a good friend of mine. Barry Sullivan. We all worked on sure. radio. We yeah. used to do three and four series a day in in, in New York. Well, radio radio is as you, you you mentioned somewhat a little bit earlier, is the place where you develop the voice of Magoo. that help, happened to be Magoo, and Magoo. then also yeah. really uh, uh, somewhat of uh, Thurston Howell. Oh, Hubert Howell. Updike. Yeah, Hubert he, Updike. Hubert Updike became Thurston Howell mm -hmm. because it's the same guy that wrote it. Well, we had many writers, mm -hmm. but the Sherwood Schwartz was on. Uh, the Alan Young show mm -hmm. where I developed Hubert Updike and that without dating myself the first time I did Hubert Updike that's a fellow with the broad A's that has the Cadillac with two chauffeurs one for right hand turns and one for left hand turns <laughs> and I did it and he was a clenched jaw guy and uh, it, it was a uh, hit overnight but the censors or the what, are, what do they call them and they got a title like uh, vice president in charge of ethics and practices ethics, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And they said, you can't do that character. And I said, why not? They said, it sounds like Franklin Roosevelt. Well, I said, that's the same background I want this guy to come from. Mm -hmm. But it did have the broad A, if you remember. He used to talk quite like that. So I, I went ahead and did it. And uh, uh, and I put it in the mothballs. And then when Sherwood Schwartz, about 20 years later, started out with the Gilligans, he had just rich man. That's all he had. And mm -hmm. he called me up. He said, would you like to play the rich man? I said, Hubert? He said, well, Hubert's father. <laughs> I said, okay. So the first script we shot in Hawaii, I, I, I took Sh uh, Sherwood on his word. He, I, he said, you know, I didn't realize I was going to get you. And he said, I just wrote a kind of a rich guy with a couple of lines. He said, but uh, I promise you when we get to Hawaii, we'll, we'll rewrite it. When I, he gave me the script, the wine list was longer on the plane. <laughs> and uh, But he made up for it. And, uh, so that... Nothing gained, nothing lost, and uh, that, that's that's what it was. It was, uh, and actually, Magoo, we used to have to do what was called a double in those days. Uh, you you played your straight voice, and then to if you wanted to get hired, you to, for them to save money, you'd do another voice, mm -hmm. as far away from your own voice as possible as you possibly could. Well, I developed a voice. He was a sheriff. He was a farmer. He was, but it was. Essentially, Magoo, and that's where mm -hmm. I, I I I developed him. I I did about five years on Edgar Bergen's show. I played a pompous guy that he would run into, and radio was great training. That I don't know where the kids today are going to get anything equal it, because uh, I came too late for stock companies in vaudeville. So radio was our mm -hmm. break in, mm -hmm. and practically all the good actors out here now of my age. You well, you know, cut their teeth in radio because yes. you'd have to do dialects, ages, you know, and you had to create a picture with you, just your voice, and you didn't have. In a lot of ways, radio was a lot funnier. You could be funnier on radio than you could mm -hmm. on television. Jack Benny mm -hmm. never was as funny on television as he was on radio. Well, he because you counted on the uh, the element yeah. of the listener's imagination. If we had time. I got a tape upstairs. I'm the real. Ha My wife were here. She'd kill me. Uh, <laughs> Henny, you, mm -hmm. you, you, you've seen her, haven't you? Sure. Yeah. Well, she, she's going to be on the tour. We're going to be in Chicago. You know? Good. But i got a tape. I'll bring it to Chicago. Is that okay. a deal? Okay, fine. Uh, it's considered the funniest scene on, Benny ever did on radio. And he's trying to, he's buying a new, a used car. 
and I played the dealer. Mm -hmm. And he drives up in the Maxwell. It is hilarious, <laughs> and the timing, and because you imagine what you're what you're seeing. Everyone has a different picture, but we we could go much wilder, and you can in, yeah. in, in t yeah. television. You did a lot with Jack Benny on his show over yeah. the years, didn't you? Yes, As I one did. of the one of those special kind of characters who comes in and does a two and a half pages and then moves on, and but gets out. always That's right. yeah. always uh, is there to add to the whole Benny mystique. Yeah. Now you uh, supported uh, uh, Danny Kay on his show yeah, for, uh, for a little while. Yeah, played the sponsor. And and then I worked with George and Gracie. Mm -hmm. They live. They were next door to us in television. And I married Joan. Mm -hmm. and now we go ahead. We're leapfrogging all over the well, place. Well, that's okay. Then I married Joan was a very successful. Mm -hmm. to talk about successful series, but I married Joan never got the credit it should. Excuse me while I take another slug of this tea, and it is tea. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I married Joan preceded. Uh, uh, Gilligan's Island by oh, uh, a, gosh, few quite years, a few yeah. years. Yeah, I yeah. married Joan was was uh, right after I I, I love Lucy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, we shot all the we shot. I married Joan down in General Service Studios, mm -hmm. and right next door was Burns and Allen shooting their mm -hmm, show. Mm -hmm. I love Lucy, their show, and Southern, Ozzie and Harry. Oh boy. Uh, Oh, a few more. Life with Father. We were all in this little <laughs> studio, and most of the stars were women. Oh, uh, Eve Arden. Mm -hmm. yeah, Armis Brooks. So instead of a wall, we had a girdle around this. <laughs> and we watched the. It was like a, a big, you know, play uh -huh. play yard. Mm -hmm. Did did there was something about the I Married Joan series that uh, aside, of course, from the the comedy, and you were a Joan's husband, Judge Bradley, Judge Bradley Stevens. Stevens. Yeah. You've done uh, your work. I know, <laughs> and uh, well, they're still on the air. You know, they're they're. Uh, you know, I, that comes up in trivia. Mm -hmm. Have you played trivia? Uh, oh, the new game. Yeah, haven't gotten a hold of it yet. It, it, you we can't got a guy that works part time for us. It uh -huh. is absolutely marvelous. Uh -huh. He won thirty seven thousand dollars on the on the pyramid. Oh my gosh! And it, now you can't talk to him. <laughs> Thank God he's still working for us. <laughs> he got a car. He's in Japan now. But he he know, knew everything. We had a this trucker that used to call me when uh, from Boston, who was a trivia mm -hmm. nut. And I used to we rigged it up. I'd go upstairs with with questions, and he would take the phone down there, and the guy in Boston, <laughs> and uh, I used to shoot the questions at him. But one one of the questions that come up in in most trivia is uh, what is what was the the what you just said the occupation of Joan Davis's mm -hmm. husband and I Mary Joan. His name was Bradley J. Stevens, mm -hmm. right? Right. And he was a judge. And that was what made it so funny is that she made an idiot out of the judge. Correct. And that's the reason, when I went over to England for the first time, right after I married Joan, I hadn't been there. I got off the ship. And I wasn't prepared for the excitement that it caused with Magoo and mm -hmm. I married Joan. Now, television was just starting in, in Great Britain. And I married Joan was on at 8 o'clock on Sunday night. Had no opposition. The whole island just stopped for a half an hour. <laughs> And I walked up Piccadilly Circus. The people j threw things out of the window. And I went to lunch at the Gary Club. And I had lunch, having lunch at the same, the Gary Club is an actor's club in London. Having it with Sir Lawrence Olivier, Sir Michael Redgrave, Sir John Mills, Sir John Gielgud, all the aristocracy of the British theater. They came out of the, the, the club the same time as I did. And we were waiting for cabs. And a school let out across the street. And the kids mobbed me, ignored them, and I said, hey, that's John Gielgud. <laughs> and uh, the reason that, that I, I, I talked to a, a program guy over in, in England, and he told me, I said, Why, what is the popularity of I Married Joan? He said, well, you don't, you don't you understand? In England, it's a double joke. Because in England, you know, a woman, you'll pardon if I tell you, sp speaks only when spoken to. You know, walks four <laughs> paces behind. You know, mm -hmm. and to see a woman, and the and the and the British also revere a judge much more than we do. Mm -hmm. To them, a judge is a big guy. You know, wears mm -hmm. that wig, and he's a powerful figure. You don't fool around with him. So to have a judge on one end and a woman, a mere woman, <laughs> making an idiot out of a judge, just tickled them absolutely out of their mind. <laughs> And another thing, I'm, uh, Magoo is just 
the, the, the English people go, they, they have Magoo festivals in theaters. Mm -hmm. I, someone sent me a, 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 a marquee, uh, uh, said, Mr. Magoo, also Moby Dick, or a Gone with the Wind. The, big, big. <laughs> <laughs> the feature was the, the yeah, cartoon, yeah, Magoo Mr. Was Magoo. Over the, the yeah. feature, whatever and in the, addition, we show yeah. Gone with the Wind. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Princess Margaret used to have Magoo's run off at the palace. And when I got there, the, 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 one of the British papers on the front page had Mr. M uh, Princess Margaret's boyfriend arrives or something in England. It was Mr. Magoo. <laughs> on, the, on the I Mary Jones series, the, the, uh, there was no live music behind the opening and closing <laughs> credits. And it was a, you know, like a group, uh, a group singing. Boy, you know everything. <laughs> and I want to yeah. know why that was. Well, they had a strike. Uh-huh, uh-huh. ASCAP, I think, mm -hmm. or the musicians of some kind. So they bootlegged it down in Mexico. No, they they could use voices, but they couldn't use instruments. Couldn't use the instruments, uh-huh. So that was boom, 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 mm -hmm. boom, boom. They used musical bridges. That was a, 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 a quartet going. You know, instead of the yeah. bing, 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 I Mary Joan, Joan. <laughs> what a girl, what a girl, what a guy. <laughs> I Mary Joan, dee 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 dee. Do you know the rest? Of well, I'm, you dee, lost dee, me dee, two dee, bars dee, back. Dee, dee. <laughs> but that's the way it was. And yeah. then they would, they would even the little musical bridges between the had, scenes. That's right. They yeah. used to set the scenes yeah. and, and the, the, the it theme and everything. It made for a very distinctive beam, boom, series. Boom, 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 boom. boom, boom. Do you know Gilligan's Island? Once there was a sailor man. De -de 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 -de. Do you know that one? Well, I can't sing it like you can, but I've, it's, uh, it's part of my life, that theme song. Most kids can hum it. I, yeah. I, I, I never learned it. Well, once again, the kids uh, sit and watch yeah. it, and, and, uh, and kids never mind repeats. All right, you know? I, you, you're a trivia. What was Magoo's first name, Mr. Magoo's first name? Oh, you got me. Quincy. 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 And on Hollywood Squares one time, they had a question, what is the second most identifiable voice in the world? Well, the person who was guessing naturally assumed because I was on the panel, Mr. Magoo, which mm -hmm. was correct. That was correct. Mm -hmm. But, of course, what everyone wants to know, who's the first one? And? Who do you think it is? The most identifiable voice well, in, the, in world? the world? Next, yeah. The most identifiable, uh, Magoo is the second most identifiable. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Because they just know... Winston Churchill, maybe? No. It's a trick. Uh -huh. It is the, the recorded guy on tape who calls the faithful to prayer in all the Muslim countries. Oh. <laughs> See, he used to come out on a, on a tower, remember? Mm -hmm. But that's all done on tape. And they got one, <laughs> one priest to do it. Oh. And in India alone, he's got a 97 share. <laughs> <laughs> Well, your comedy uh, ability is uh, very keen yet. We're talking to Jim Backus, and we have uh, lots more to talk about. A uh, great career and a new book that's uh, coming out very soon, which is the reason uh, why Jim is coming to Chicago a little later this year. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. We're talking with Jim Backus. Now, Jim, tell us about the new book that you have. Well... That's a long story, but here it goes. Uh, the book is called Bacchus Strikes Back. Originally, it was called Shake, Rattle, and Roll, <laughs> which is a title I like, but the objection was that they might think it's a chubby checkers mm -hmm. or to do with music. And uh, what it was is about five years ago, I was stricken with an, an uh, undiagnosable, is that is there such a word? Good enough. Disease, a neurological disorder, which they had many names for, none of which were ac accurate, but they all were devastating. And it was what was called a catastrophic disease, and still is. Because it's one of those things you, you live with, you don't live, you know, you don't die from. And so I was grounded. I was unable to walk. Uh, I couldn't u use my arms very well, and uh, I had trouble talking. In other words, I was a mess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Rather than, I read Anatomy of, a, of an Illness. Uh, what the heck is his Norman name? Cousins. Cousins, you're Cousins. right. Norman Cousins' book. And he is right over here at UCLA, right across the street from us. And I was very impressed, and I talked to him. I talked to him on the phone. And uh, so I decided to write a 
the story of a disease from a humorous side, not making fun of it, but the way it happened, and it turned out funny, because it is funny. Everything's funny. Mm -hmm. Not ha ha he 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 look at him, you know, but uh, it was sad, and uh, it was a labor of love. And I finished it. Henny wrote it with me. She was I, I would write kind of loosely, and she's a very good uh, technician. She put it together. And we had written two comedy books back in 57, 62. We wrote Rocks on the Roof, which is a story of two New York kids move, moving out here to Lotus Land. You know, we, we never mm -hmm. figured on taking out the garbage or barbecue pits or any of that. I left Cleveland to get away from that. So here <laughs> we are back again. And that was a fairly successful book. It was launched on This Is Your Life, mm -hmm. which is an automatic 50,000 sale in those days. Ralph Edwards in the bookstore. I was signing autographs. You hear sign this? Well, you you couldn't dream up better publicity. Oh than boy, that. yeah. And then we wrote another book, which a story of our our delayed honeymoon in Europe, called uh, "What Are You Doing After the Orgy." These books <laughs> were both fairly successful. So that that was our. Then of course, God in radio. We we used to write so much without ever thinking that we were writing. You know, we wrote lead-ins and gags. So we uh, had written a novel that was in the hands of an English agent. Uh, and uh, so we just sent him the rough cut of this. And he said, this is great. This is sensational. We'll finish it up. We had a few suggestions. And we went back to work. And it really saved my life, the, the, the labor of doing it. Mm -hmm. that, 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 you know. And we finished it, and it was sold overnight. To Stein and Day, one of the better publishing houses. And I have a letter from Saul Stein that's just beautiful. Well, uh, and now the book is going to be coming out uh, this uh, in early, May. early in May. Yeah, and then we mm -hmm. hit the chicken a la king, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll be hopscotching uh, all over the country for that uh, sort of thing. We open in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have to meet the publisher. We have never met these people. Mm -hmm. We've we talk to them every day on the phone, you know, they, mm -hmm. their cuts cut this because they're composing the galleys. We got 20 pages of pictures, mm. and it, it, it's published in May, so we'll be going back June 8th. We open on the Today Show. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah. then uh, we do the New York bit mm -hmm. uh, for three days, and that's it. press interviews. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite, I'm taking a physiotherapist with me. Uh-huh. And uh, to keep me in in shape. Now, does the physiotherapist? Excuse me. Does he work with you every day? Every day. Seven days. Every day, seven uh -huh. days a week. Uh -huh. Occasionally uh -huh. we go, but uh, how much? I, how much time does uh, do you work with him? An hour, an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. I ran two miles this mm -hmm. afternoon. You ran, ran in in place in in, the, no. in your house. You out here? Uh, around the park. Oh. There's a whole park where uh, Arm and Hammer. Endowed it. It's a little uh, miniature golf course mm -hmm. with a jogging track, and everybody you mm -hmm. meet all you ever everyone you ever knew there. I do two miles. I do sit-ups. I do push-ups, which I couldn't mm -hmm. do have done six years ago. It still knocks me out, but it uh, it keeps me loose, and it's the only way I can operate. Well, that, it's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, from from really being almost on the edge to to this you 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 look marvelous and aside from walking a little slow and i think you're just favoring yourself a little bit yeah. on that uh, i think that it's 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 wonderful and that's what all that's about yeah. that uh, yeah so that's all down in the book mm -hmm. and uh, various doctors and uh Psychiatrists and you name it, we've got it all. But uh, and it's flashbacks because mm -hmm. I had a lot of time to think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it altered my life completely. I enjoy things mm -hmm. more. Well, you got a new lease on life right. uh, for this whole thing. Are you um, uh, able or thinking of doing some some more things in, in on television? Well, on yeah, I, I I can get it all together for a couple of hours. I did mm -hmm. a picture called Prince Jack, which I'm very proud of. A good friend of mine, gosh, 
Mr. Levitt, I call him. He's a, he wrote and produced and directed and, and uh, got it together. To I think the finite f i n i t e of the Kennedy assassination. This it, this says it all and wraps it all up. Mm -hmm. I hope because this is supposedly what the real what happened. I I don't know. And it's a it's an expose, but it's it you it's there's only ten of us in the cast. Dana Andrew played Cardinal McIntyre. Robert Guillaume, you know the fellow yes. in Benson, he does Martin Luther King. He's marvelous. Kenny Marr is a very underrated character actor mm -hmm. and comedian. You, you know who Kenny sure. Marr is? Funny, big, big funny fun, guy. Yeah. He does Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. You can't believe it. He and I, I play a dirty, nasty, sniveling Texas publisher with a real down, you know, Texan dialect. Mm -hmm. And he, Lyndon and I, Kenny and I have a fight. He is Lyndon and me as his dirty, nasty publisher. It is hilarious. Of course, you could only it's all the four-letter words in the world mm -hmm. because that's the way those guys talk. You yes. can't uh -huh. say, golly, darn you, you know. <laughs> and uh, Cameron Mitchell plays the General Walker, the fascist general. Bob Hogan plays uh, Kennedy. He's marvelous. And uh, as I, uh, Lloyd Nolan I, I plays Joe Kennedy, the old man. That's all there is, except the, an unknown blonde in bed with JFK. No. All you see is her head. Mm -hmm. We wanted Henny to play it. <laughs> <laughs> is there a release date scheduled for this yet? <clears throat> I saw a, a, an advance. Some, no, I don't think it's been set yet. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're getting a distributor, though. And it's a, it's a very good picture. I did that, and uh, I did, didn't know... Levitt was a wonderful guy. He came out here and he talked to me. He said, do you think you can do it? I said, yeah, I think I can. He said, we'll make it as easy as we can for you. And I put in the day, 9 in the morning till 12 at night. He kept saying, can you do one more shot? And I did it. Don't ask me how. Well, that's just that's part of, uh, part of the determination. When you've got something to do, you, you yeah. go ahead and do it. I think it's a... Uh, uh, and a very important thing, if you sit around and feel sorry for yourself, anybody, healthy yeah. or no, then you, you're going to be in the, in when the are you on doldrums all the time. Every Saturday afternoon. Live? Live from 1 o'clock until 5 o'clock. He's very good, isn't he? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you about a role you played on a, uh, a television series, a short-run TV series called Blondie. Now you played oh, J.C. Dithers J. C. on that Dithers, show, didn't yeah. you? Henny played Mrs. <clears throat> Dithers. You and your, your wife was yeah, on that? Yeah, and Will Hutchins mm -hmm. played uh, Dagwood. Dagwood, and Patricia Hardy played uh, Blondie. Blondie. Yeah. She was wonderful, and the two kids, I forget their names. They were, <laughs> that lasted 13 weeks. Just a quickie. It was a quickie. I don't know why I didn't. I thought it was kind of funny. Did you ever see it? I don't think I did. It was I don't think anyone had a blink. There, there was an earlier, an earlier Blondie. TV series, oh. I think, with uh, Penny Singleton. No, that was in pictures. Well, no. I know she did the movies, but I think I think I was on radio. Well, do you think she did it on? I think there was a yeah, short. Yeah, you might have. Yeah, back in the Stone Penny. Age. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere in this room, Perry Lafferty, who who is one of my, uh, if you're such a thing, is one of my best friends. He and he and his wife were married the same day that, that we were. Oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we we go back quite a few years. Perry was vice president of CBS. He, he put on Gilligan's. He also put on Blondie. It was not his idea, I must say. It was someone way up there somewhere. And he's, you know the way MacArthur, you get a, a, the pen that MacArthur signed, signed a mm -hmm. treaty with, which is mounted on a <laughs> memento. He mounted a, the pen, a pen on a piece of mahogany with a beautiful brass plate and said, this is the pen, pen that canceled Blondie. Oh. <laughs> Sort of an inside joke. Yeah, I would say. Well, some of them. They I were guess you kind would. of funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of Penny Singleton, uh, she had a radio show after the Blondie series, uh, on which you portrayed uh, a real estate uh, agent. Where do you come up with all this? Well, I have vase. You have vase. <laughs> I have relatives we? living in Bel Air. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you who's a wonderful guy is George Burns. Uh -huh. He comes over here. He used to come over about once a week. Sat in that chair over there. Amazing man. Eighty-nine years mm -hmm. old. Mm -hmm. Just got back on the from the world cruise on the Queen. The vitality of the man. The the energy. And he everything is positive. Mm -hmm. 
I said, George, you like the Q- the Q- Henny was talking to him too. Do you like the QE too? He says, love it, love it, love it. When he said it's final, you know, he says, yeah, it's a great ship, great ship. And now most people wax nostalgic about the Queen Elizabeth, the the original, the original yeah. one. He said, no, no, couldn't hold a candle to this. <laughs> when you go to dinner at his house, you 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 meet the damnedest people like Roger Miller. <laughs> no, well, old. he toured. You know, he toured uh, with Roger. Miller. Yeah, well, but yeah. there's always somebody like somebody that. You, you expect, you know, to see the the old guard from Hillcrest over mm-hmm. there. You know, and they're they're kids. Back porch majority or whatever they, mm-hmm. they you know, always mm-hmm. like a surprise. And 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 it is, it's a funny thing. And George doesn't have any of his mementos like this. I, I love the the pictures around the mm. wall. It, this room is very. But he warm doesn't. And very he, nice. Yeah, he doesn't. He, he has. I, I don't think he. I don't know where his Oscar is. That he won for Sunshine Boys. There's no mementos mm-hmm. of the past. It's all out here, which is a very healthy thing. Well, he's the funniest right. man in the mm-hmm. world. <laughs> One Most last. Of it I can't tell you. <laughs> One last question, and, and uh, maybe a memory for you. There was a, a series on radio uh, on which you, you were a part of it, and you and a lot of the great supporting character actors from radio were also on this show. It was called The Mel Blanc Show. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Hans, yeah, Hans Conrad was on there. and Ugga, ugga, boo, bugga, boo, boo. That's ugga. right, that's right. Did you talk to Mel? Oh yes, some time ago we talked with. Yeah, well, with yeah, I, I break him up whenever I see him because we're the only two people alive. But no one else. <laughs> uh, 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 and poor Hans, he's gone. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Joe Kearns was on that. Joe Kearns and Jerry uh, Hausner, Mary Jane Croft, and Mary so Jane many Croft, people. Yeah. It was it really uh, bringing together of a lot of great comedians. You know, Jerry Hausner did all the babies on radio. That's what I understand. He painted that picture. He played Waldo. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. There's a, a wonderful picture of Mr. Magoo over the on the mantle. Overlooking there. the room. <laughs> Overlooking the house that he built. Yeah. Jim Backus, I'm so happy to have been able to spend well, a so little happy time you with came. you. We, I think we started out a little slow, didn't we? No, we started off quickly, I think. But this was a very <laughs> lovely way to spend the. I got a little sentimental, started to well up a little, but. Uh, <laughs> God bless. Well, I wish you a lot of luck and good health and uh, and much see happiness in, in the future. Right. We'll see you in June. Okay. Thank you.